Are you registered to vote? I sure hope so. We only have a few weeks left in this election cycle, so make sure your voice counts. Go to vote.org, Ballotopedia, or Google your local voting district and find out more information. Make your voice heard. We are coming up to the end of Season 2, but don't worry. Season 3 is already in the process of being recorded. Make sure you subscribe to the show so you'll be notified when the new releases are out. Welcome to the One Minute Preceptor Podcast, brought to you by Med School Coach. Each episode, get clinical rotation advice and tips to prepare for your externships in healthcare. We interview preceptors and physician educators who will prepare you for your rotation and improve your clinical experience. Now, here's your host, Chase DeMarco. With social media playing such a big role in our lives, from politics to hashtag MedBikini, it's important for medical students, too, to take a look at the role of these platforms and what it plays in their academic and professional lives. So today we're joined with Dr. Dana Cariel, a physician entrepreneur and founders of SoMeDocs, Doctors on Social Media. And we're going to cover some of the changing paradigms regarding social media in the medical field. Dana, thank you so much for joining me. Sure. And thank you so much for having me on. I'm really excited because we've been sharing the same online space for quite some time. And I appreciate that you see the value in dabbling online. And I'm excited to talk about it. Definitely. As a physician entrepreneur area there myself, I see the importance of it and didn't really see the importance of it as much when I was focusing on med school, because I think the general rule for a lot of students or the fear is just stay off it as much as possible. Hide yourself because you don't want something to be permanently out there that can affect your career and everything later on. And I'm curious to hear some of your thoughts on the best practices and getting away maybe from the fear mentality and the benefits that we can really see from it, even as students. But maybe you can first talk a little bit more about yourself and how you got into this space and what SoMeDocs really does. First of all, I want to say that I shared your apprehensions at the start. I'm thinking back to about 10 years ago or maybe even 15 years ago. I viewed these social media networks as places that I did not want to be present in. I took myself off, in fact, for a long period of time because I felt that it was toxic. I didn't like some of the things that I was seeing in it, but it was only during my time away from medicine, and that's part of the answer to your question, that I realized just the power that it had for me, both as a physician in my career in medicine and then as an entrepreneur once I left traditional clinical medicine. So my story is that I'm a board-certified internist. I trained at Montefiore, Albert Einstein, and I finished my training in 2006. I work in New York City at the World Trade Center, a 9-11-based organization. I then took a three-year sabbatical type time away from medicine, during which time I had a lot of discoveries, self-discoveries made. And then I went back into medicine in a part-time basis because I had three children. We're a dual physician family. I felt that it was just too much of a load to do full-time. And so I did private practice settings in two locations then over the span of a bunch of years. In the meantime, I also not only founded my current company, SoMeDocs, but also was able to develop it and expand it as much as was feasible when you're working a job and also a mother of children and you just you know have to take care of life as well. So that's my story in a nutshell. And I'm excited to talk to everybody about the online worlds and some of the pitfalls that we have to look out for. And I've definitely seen you around for a long time on social media and we've been in contact for quite some time. So it's great to have this ability to meet you face to face and talk about these things and really help med students get into the sphere and know the best practices. And I know something I keep forgetting to do in recent episodes is asking the icebreaker question. And I really want to see what is a very you know, interesting or outrageous story that you have for students, whether it's be clinical or somewhere in the medical field. Yeah, I've got a story that I actually wrote about on my blog, which people can check out at drcoriel.com. I wrote about this a while back, but I want to summarize it. It's a story where I was in training I was a resident. It was probably my third year in my internal medicine residency. And I had interns and students that were with me on the team that I was leading. We were doing our morning rounds. We were following up on the morning intake. We were walking around the floor and we were visiting a particular patient that was giving 
the medical student, the male medical student, a very hard time about drawing labs. Basically, what happened was the nurse called the medical student and explained to him that the patient was a hard stick or did not want to be stuck or whatever it was. We had to make our rounds. And so I said to them, you know what? The med student was clearly scared to attempt the blood draw. It might have been his first time. We decided to go visit the patient ourselves live. So I took the whole team there and I was actually super excited because I was just a good phlebotomist. I really enjoyed it. It was fun for me and relaxing and I always seemed to find the vein. So I decided this was great. I was going to teach my crew. I was going to shine and I was going to make the patient happy because it was going to be a quick in and out. And so we approached the patient who was sitting in the middle of the corridor and she was an elderly woman. And the nutshell of the story was that she was listened to us explain that we were going to draw the labs and then said to me, you are absolutely not touching me. You are not fooling me. I know who's the doctor here and it's definitely not you. And the irony of this was that she was so insistent that the male in the group was the doctor and no amount of arguing could convince her otherwise that this went on and on. And the male actually explained to her that he was a medical student, but she was like, "Uh uh-uh, like, I don't believe it. So the end of the story was that... (laughs) It was really just a gender bias, right? She didn't think that I was the physician because I was a woman and she wasn't shy about it. The end of the story was that the medical student ended up needing to draw her lab and learning on her. And again, it was a pity because we explained it again and again. But at the end of the day, we need to get rid of our gender biases and trust that in 2020, women can not only be doctors, but can do the job well. (laughs) So that's my story. And even from a female patient, so like the gender bias there is still ingrained on both sides. It's very ironic. It might have been generational. She was an elderly patient. I mean, I can only wager a guess that maybe traditionally speaking for her, women were not physicians. And so she just refused, despite her constant like arguing with her, she just refused to accept that. And so we said, okay, listen, it is what it is. All right. You're going to be the test dummy for this med student then. That's your choice. (laughs) But it was fine. I mean, the medical student can draw labs too. And thankfully, he learned. Good. Yeah. I was a phlebotomist for almost two years before med school. So I know how that is. They would always send me for the hard sticks too. You know, I loved feeling around with my finger for that sort of bouncy location where you then, you know, insert it, whether it's the butterfly or the straight out regular size needle and everything. And you notice people's veins forever after. Yeah, I've seen that on Twitter and stuff. You know, when it's hot and everyone's veins comes up close to the skin, (laughs) you always think of phlebotomizing. All right, let's, we'll get back into the social media stuff now. I don't think we have too many people here very interested in phlebotomy, although it's quite fascinating and generally don't want to stick a patient like eight times. So get good at it. (laughs) For sure. So let's take a broad overview here. What are some of the big outlines, guidelines, do's and don'ts of a student right now? They're thinking about the vastly evolving landscape of social media and what to do and what not to do. What are some outlines that we can give them? So in a nutshell, social media is a really powerful communication tool. I believe that we can leverage it the right way as professionals and we can really impact our careers. We just have to do it right. And that's where the term curation comes in. We can curate our online presence in the same way that a magazine curates its pages in order to give off the message that it wants to send. And so right then and there is just a powerful tool for anybody, whether you're an attending or a resident or a medical student, to give off a message to the world that you want to convey. So What I suggest to those in a medical student level is that they do this cautiously. I think everybody, first and foremost, should do this cautiously. We live in a society where a lot of canceling occurs and cancel culture, for those who don't know, sort of stands for when people make statements and other people sort of hop on board and sort of say that they're wrong, but then paint a big picture as if everything they say is wrong. Like you say one thing that someone disagrees with and you're just a bad person. That's sort of what cancel culture stands for. And so we've got to be extra careful 
as professionals to paint ourselves in a good light because we're human beings, right? Everyone's got their preconceived notions and what we, you know, think about. We're not all perfect. We make mistakes. But social media is slower to forgive our mistakes. So I think that I have different advice for people depending on where they are in their medical trajectory because I think it's easier for attendings, for example, who are working for themselves to make mistakes because the potential payment for it is much less than a medical student who still has to impress others and has to really play by the rules, et cetera, et cetera. I think everyone needs to maintain professionalism, but I do think that you can be more yourself once you're an attending. And the reason I stress that is because it depends on your endpoint goal, but a lot of attendings have really taken on personas online that sometimes veer away from professionalism, but is still accepted as okay because they are attendings. I'm talking about something like using profanity online, right? I mean, some doctors have used profanity because it's just catchy and people like it. They're still teaching evidence based medicine. They're just using some profanity just to kind of be cool and to get people's attention, and it works for them. I don't think that medical students could do that in the same way. I think it could have repercussions that for attendings is not there. I think medical students should use more caution when they tackle online presence. I think that they should think about the curation of their presence. And I think that they should think through, like any other physician and brand that goes out there, I think that everybody should think through the endpoint goal of dabbling online. So first and foremost, before you go online, you should ask yourself, why am I doing this? Am I doing this just to kind of mingle and socialize, which is okay, versus what is my agenda for being online? And maybe I can do something that's career moving like advocacy work or like finding mentors or like doing something else that can advance my career. So my biggest advice as a positive using social media is actually to define why you are on social media. I think the advocacy point is the one that might be the most confusing because you tend to see traditionally non-professionals, just the average user on social media, is going to retweet anything they want to, repost, re, you know, just take a meme, copy it over, repost it without actually fact-checking, without doing anything, because they feel like they are doing some form of advocacy, whether they claim it to be that format or not. That's what it is. They're sharing their beliefs. And that is where a lot of students can potentially get in the most trouble, especially, I'll admit, I I'm at fault of doing this too. You know, we probably all do, but especially in this point in time when there's so much chaos going on, there's a big election coming up. There's a lot of beliefs that people have that they want others to know about. And it seems like it's very difficult to be you and be honest about yourself and still be careful. We work hard, we study hard, but sometimes we still need a little bit of extra assistance. And that's why I'm happy to be partnered with Med School Coach to bring you free mentorship sessions and discounted tutoring sessions. That's right. You can get free mentorship sessions with me by going to prospectivedoctor.com slash chase. There are limited numbers of 30-minute free sessions available each month, so get yours for free now. And if you need help with your MCAT or board exam prep, you can get 10% off of purchases at medschoolcoach.com. Just type in the code chase10 with your purchase and start improving your scores now. I see that ability to like share and retweet as going down a hole that's dangerous. Meaning we're all sort of like piling up in a gang mentality sort of thing, even when it's our colleagues and we think we're helping them out. A lot of times we don't really know exactly who the person behind the account is. We're not always sure about what we're retweeting. And for that reason, I personally have held off on, quote, supporting others oftentimes. And it wasn't because I didn't want to support. It was because I'm not 100% sure that I'm in agreement with something someone says, or I'm not really sure where it's coming from, or et cetera, et cetera. I think social media makes it very easy to suddenly be associated with others. And I think what's important is for us to still maintain our individuality and not 
get swayed by sort of numbers, right? Because that's where our society becomes a dangerous place where we sort of just hop on board because someone is an influencer. It scares me. The whole concept of influencer is so powerful. And I would like educated professionals to influence positively, especially in healthcare, especially when I'm talking about my healthcare professional colleagues. But at the same time, I so value individualized thinking and thinking for yourself that I worry about this whole influencer mentality and about people just retweeting for the sake of retweeting because someone is influencing and you need to then suddenly retweet everything that they do. In the SoMeDocs Facebook group, which is open to all healthcare professionals, I have a closed private one and I have a public one, but it came up in an anonymous post where someone was like, well, now I'm getting messages from people telling me, please share. And it's becoming almost like if you're not sharing my message, then you're not believing in this or you're not a doctor. And then people are going and they're smearing them and it's becoming almost, and it's not even about politics, but it's becoming like we're in politics suddenly where if we're not sharing someone's work, then we're not supportive. And it's scary. It's a scary space to be in. So again, that's why I think for medical students, especially I hesitate. I think attendings have less to lose But I think we all have a lot to lose when we start to dabble online because the public opinion on social media is much quicker to judge than public opinion when we're sitting in the privacy of our own office taking care of patients. And I think a big issue is traditionally medical professionals, scientists, those types of professions were very quiet. They were behind the scenes. They were doing the research journals, but they weren't out the face of the problem, the face of the solution, the face of the research, that was left up to often news pundits, which would then get information wrong. And then the public starts to distrust the science behind it. I think that is a big issue of the past. It can now be corrected with social media if done properly. But then we also do see certain ones, especially those that are pseudoscientists, I would claim, becoming the loudest voices on social media, getting the most retweets, especially from those that don't understand the science that they're talking about. And that is where that kind of negative influencer, that pseudoscience influencer is definitely scary and powerful. But I think the only way to combat that is to have more rational and proper scientifically educated individuals doing the same thing. Absolutely. And that's where I brought in my strengths to the table is that I recognized that the people that were the loudest and the more effective in their marketing and branding, they were actually influencing. When I started this years ago, Actually, one of the things that really sparked my passion in this was the fact that I was seeing both pseudoscience play out in my neighborhood and my close family and friends. I was also seeing a lot of like smear campaigns against physicians locally where the physicians weren't even there and couldn't defend themselves, but were being spoken about in communities and groups online. But in doing this for a long time, I've learned so much about the online world and social media. And you're right, when you refer to journalists and such as being in control, first of all, because they've got the mass audience and they've got the money. They also have the ability to market and brand themselves well. So at the end of the day, it's about good marketing and branding strategies that get us heard. And so that's why I decided to use my company, SomiDocs, to sort of help healthcare professionals to, first of all, to give them the space in which to shine. And secondly, to help them not only learn the tools of marketing and branding, but also to do it with them and for them. And so that's where I'm now expanding is in that space is in how can I give them the space to both learn the tools, but also be able to have me and my team that I'm forming now market and help to brand physicians so that we could get more of our talent out there and heard. A lot of people that aren't physicians, they have time to craft their communication skills and their marketing abilities and their content creation abilities. So they shine in that perspective and then they get the attention and then the doctors come in with their science and our degrees are important and people will listen for the most part. But at the end of the day, on social media and online, other things catch people's attention before degrees. And that's what worries me. And not just physicians, but the way med students can leverage this too. And I've heard others that went through residency in the past year or two do this is if they had a popular YouTube channel or podcast or some form of media that was high credibility. They had on guests that were very credible. It was very good content. 
that was brought up during the residency interviews and that helped them along to get a higher residency possibly than they would have otherwise. And now step one, going to pass fail, that's going to be probably counted as less important in the near future. So these extracurriculars you can do can really help you. You just want to be careful of how you approach it. Yeah, it goes back to what I said about the curation, right? We curate it just like we would curate a magazine and very similarly, just like we would curate a CV. In fact, it's been up for discussion many times online between, you know, all the med Twitter people, um, for example, on Twitter, where even academicians, definitely attendings are talking about insertion of our social media work and achievements into our CV. Because at the end of the day, it's commendable. A lot of what we do is commendable. And there is a lot of sway and a lot of influence using the online world. So when we accomplish something that's significant, then we can absolutely insert it into our CV. And that's where advancing our career can occur. And that is a great segue into my next question, which is, what do we think about the different platforms? So when I reach out to physicians, I'm more likely to use LinkedIn. When I reach out to students, I'm more likely to use Facebook. Twitter and Instagram are not two platforms that I really personally got involved in to a great extent in the past. So I'll occasionally post something there, but I don't feel as comfortable with them, don't put as much time into them. So when students are looking at these different platforms, there are different rules, there are different audiences, there are different hashtags or groups or ways to follow people and topics. Do you feel like one is more professional than another or that you should put more focus this way to Instagram and more visual media-based platforms than text-based platforms? Or how do you approach those types of questions? Yeah, they're all different. So first of all, I've had experience with all of them. I know how all of them work. They do all work differently. First of all, they do all have different target audiences, which can work to our favor in figuring out which one we want to use. Again, this all goes back to what's your endpoint goal. If it's to connect with your target audience, if it's to sell something, if it's to spread a message, your target audience matters for all of those things. But it's more than just that. It's more than just who sits there. It's also about what are you good at and what gives you pleasure in partaking in, right? Because at the end of the day, if the majority of your target audience is sitting on a certain platform, but you don't connect with it, you don't do well with it, you're not good at it, or it doesn't give you pleasure, then why? Why do it? Now, endpoint goals can differ there. If you're doing it for fun, then you should definitely not be in a space that causes you stress and anxiety, especially not for med students. There's so much stress and anxiety there already. You should weigh all of those factors. How does this platform work? Who sits there? But you know what? There's people of all demographics sitting in every single platform. So at the end of the day, it's about being creative and clever and leveraging that space in order to appeal to the target audience that you're trying to appeal to. And you know what? It's about doing what you're good at. So if you're good at making videos, then go for it. Make YouTube videos, but curate your content to appeal to your target audience. If you're a pediatrician and you want to appeal to parents of babies, right? Let's say, I'm just making that up. Then curate your video in a way that thinks, and this is all marketing and branding kinds of things. You've got to think about how do I structure this video in order to appeal to that population versus if you're really good at tweeting out, you know, 280 characters of really good stuff and you could do a lot of it and you love it and you try it out on Twitter and you're not taken aback by some of the harshness of Twitter and you love that and you're kind of tongue in cheek and et cetera, et cetera. Great. Tackle Twitter, find your people or at least just dabble in it and have a good time build your presence up there. Um, But there's just so many combinations to what could be done. It's not a one size fits all. I always say that it's not a one size fits all. It depends on what you're trying to do and what your endpoint goal is and how you curate your presence on the path that you choose. But you are in control. Love it. Yeah, I've been hearing a lot more about tutorials. So just long form, multiple stage, medical journal based Twitter questions, basically, and receiving a lot of responses from other students and physicians on those. So it's something I've been interested in, I guess, a little more, but it hasn't been my platform of choice in the past. And like I said, the benefit to me anyway of something like LinkedIn is you can see someone's credentials. So if I see a controversial post, you can see who's posting that and who's replying to it. If I see some infrequent with my current 
network on LinkedIn, but sometimes you'll see something a little more controversial and political. And then the response is that I would put more in the anti-science movement replies to that post are generally not people that have degrees in this material. So you can then self-sort instead of everyone having an equal voice, like on Facebook or something like that. And by the way, some people like you are more hesitant to engage and other people are actually out to not argue, but to counter misinformation, not because they always want to change the minds of the other person, but because they want it all to be out there so that people can look and can learn. I agree. I think Twitter is like its own sort of world and is tough for some people to get into. And so I am actually opening this up to your audience and letting them know and letting you know as well that SoMeDocs actually has a Twitter chat. And you can all, especially medical students, you can start there. First of all, we open it up to guest moderators every single week. So if you want us to hold your hand and you want to learn with it, then you come on board. First of all, it gives you visibility because you're the moderator of something. Secondly, it's super easy to do. Thirdly, you don't even have to moderate. You can literally just be a participant and answer whichever question you're comfortable in because it's open to the public. It's front facing. And you basically can write whatever you want to just kind of dip your toes in and engage in safe conversation if you want something shared that's safe and kind of meet people on there and learn how to do it. So anyone who wants to is welcome to reach out. I have it really as a feature of official members of SoMeDocs, but I'm happy to open it up to your audience. It happens on Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5 p.m. Pacific. So anyone's welcome to get in touch with me. Guest moderators choose their topic and we literally hold their hand. It is very easy and you learn how it works. I'm definitely adding that to my to-do list. I need to play around with that platform a little more and, and the hand-holding sounds perfect. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. I have a team in place and we hold the moderator's hand and it's great exposure. I think we have some good broad overviews here, some differences with the different social media tactics, different platforms anyway, differences between med students and having a little more limitations compared to maybe attendings that are already there. They don't have to worry about an upcoming residency match process or anything like that. So I know there's a ton more information we could potentially cover. And this is something that you cover in many different ways and many different platforms. So I guess now would be a great time to shout out a little bit more about your groups and where students can find out more. Absolutely. So our sort of central hub is probably the website, somedocs.com. And I say that because it's actually a branding lesson. It's the one site that I own that I can control because if tomorrow Facebook were to go away, then my original hub, the Facebook group would go away. But if you are a medical student, resident, or physician listening, we do have the SoMeDocs Facebook group. Now be aware when you search for us, there's several going on, including one that's copying us, which is kind of a sad, but there's SoMeDocs and then there's SoMeDocs public. The public ones, like it sounds, it's for the public, but SoMeDocs is where a lot of our conversations are happening and what I'm expanding. Our website is the main hub, SoMeDocs.com. There's two things that are available now to partake in, main things. One is a membership option. There's a lot of perks, a lot of cool things, including a data bank insertion, an office hour once a month with me and with guests, teaching people how to brand and how to market, et cetera, et cetera. And the other really cool thing that I haven't yet announced that's coming for SoMeDocs is a big lecture series that's coming that's going to be happening on a regular basis and live into the Facebook group and for free. And it's going to be really cool and curated by SoMeDocs to really inspire, to educate, and to motivate. We're going to be giving lectures by really some great folks, both physicians and actually non-physicians alike, teaching us skills outside of the medical office that we actually need nowadays to shine. So I welcome everyone to join us there. Type in SoMeDocs.com, subscribe to get the latest. And I am always open to anybody who reaches out with pitches or asking questions. You can reach me anywhere online at my handle is Dr. Coriel. So that's D-R-C-O-R-R-I-E-L. Perfect. Definitely a lot of great resources. I've used many of them myself and we will have those in the show notes for anyone listening as well. Thank you so much, Chase, for having me on. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dana. Have a great day. You too. Are you looking for productivity and study coaching? 
You can now register for a free 30-minute session with me, sponsored by Perspective Doctor. To register, go to perspectivedoctor.com slash chase and register for a 30-minute coaching session. And if you decide to use our MCAT or USMLE tutoring services, you can now use the code CHASE10 and receive 10% off of your purchase of up to $400. Just enter CHASE10 to get your discount now. The One Minute Preceptor Podcast is powered by Med School Coach. To access Med School Coach services like USMLE tutoring or residency admissions advising, visit our website at medschoolcoach.com. Good luck as you prepare for your board exams, and we hope you tune in again next time.